Today I'm gonna be telling you five horrifying and just plain f up stories of people whose lives were taken while they were camping. I've honestly been avoiding making this video because, well, I love camping and I don't like to think that something horrifying like this could happen while I'm doing it. And while you are certainly far safer on a camping trip than you are walking down just about any city street, it is also true that on rare occasions, people, sometimes even entire families, go out camping and never return alive. These stories are so, so rare, but they are also very real. And so with that said, let's head to the beautiful coast of Northern California. And by the way, if you found yourself watching a few of my videos now, you must hit that subscribe button to cover your admission on this trip to Northern California and beyond with me. You'll also be helping us reach our goal of 1 million subscribers. I don't know, I think that's a pretty fair deal. On August 14th, 2004, a young couple settled in for the night at Fishhead Beach in Jenner, California. Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen had tried to book themselves a room at a motel in the area, but this motel apparently didn't have any rooms open. The couple just so happened to have some camping gear with them, and so rather than finding another hotel or driving further, they just decided to choose a peaceful spot on the beach to rest their heads that night. Unfortunately, things at their campsite on the beach wouldn't remain peaceful for very long. That very same evening, there was a deeply disturbed man driving up the highway along the coast. This man had been suffering from mental health delusions for years, and he had also been arrested multiple times for violent crimes against humans and animals. He had exhibited every warning sign possible, and yet despite this, he was still free, roaming throughout the world, and on this particular night, he just so happened to pull over and wander down to the same beach that Cutshaw and Alan were camping on. This was a disaster waiting to happen, and the details are extremely disturbing. And with that said, things are about to get really dark, and before we get there, I do just wanna keep things light for a moment longer and tell you about Fume. Fume is the sponsor of this video, and I'm just gonna let you know that this video would not have been possible without them. And I don't just say that because they're the sponsor, but I say that because Fume has been so incredibly helpful over the last month or two that I've been using it in keeping me focused while I write these videos for all of you. Fume is what you need to help you break your bad habits. It's an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that fills the void of your bad habits in a natural, guilt-free way. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit hesitant about Fume when I first learned about it, but like I said, I've come around to absolutely love it. First of all, they have a bunch of amazing flavors. I've tried all of them, they're all great, and I really think that it, pretty much anyone is gonna be able to find a flavor that they like. And second of all, the reason that I love it so much is because, well, I'm a fidgeter, and this thing right here is a fidgeter's dream. I mean, it has this adjustable airflow dial here, which is, it just feels so nice in your hand. It's also got a, like a magnet right there. I love to just kind of fidget with it while I'm writing. And of course you can breathe through it as well. And of course it's also super helpful when you're trying to de-stress while you're breaking your bad habit. And speaking of that, stopping is something that we all put off because well, it's hard. But switching to fume is easy, it's enjoyable and well, if you didn't get the memo already, it's super fun. So please head over to tryfume.com slash kylehateshiking. You can also scan the QR code that's on the screen right now if you're watching on a TV. And be sure to use code kylehateshiking, which is gonna get you 10% off when you buy the journey pack. One more time, that's tryfum.com, code kylehateshiking. When you use that, you're gonna get an additional 10% off your order. And so thank you so much to Fume for sponsoring this video. And with that said, Let's get back into the stories. On August 14th, 2004, Sean Gallen was experiencing a mental health crisis as he drove along Highway 1 in Jenner, California. He spotted a pull-off on the side of the road, and when he did this, for whatever reason, he decided to take it. He got out of his vehicle, and he wandered down to the beach. And when he got there, he noticed Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen sleeping there and Gallen assumed that the couple were homeless and he also recalled seeing some no camping signs and 
these factors combined with his volatile mental state at the time caused him to lash out in a rage. He went back to his car, grabbed his gun, and then he returned to the beach. Tragically, I think we all can kind of figure out what happened next. Four days later, a helicopter from the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office was patrolling for an unrelated case when it spotted the slain bodies from up in the air. Investigators quickly learned that the couple were not local, but were actually visiting the area from the Midwest. Lindsay Cutshaw was 22 and Jason Allen was 26, and they were both in the area because they had been working at a Christian summer camp. And what's perhaps most tragic about this story, I mean, it's all tragic, but this, this couple was actually engaged at the time and they were planning on being married only a few weeks after they were killed when they would return home. A few days after the killings, Sean Gallen was arrested after he had been found wandering along a different beach carrying a stolen gun. This immediately made him a prime suspect, but unfortunately investigators didn't have enough solid evidence at the time to prove that he committed this crime. In a strange twist, the firearm that he was found carrying was actually not the same one that was used in the murders. Gallon was still a suspect, however, and he was actually repeatedly investigated over the coming years, but it wasn't until 2017 that the police finally nabbed him. And honestly, the circumstances around this are just as tragic as the 2004 crime itself. Sean Gallon would unfortunately go on to kill again, and this time it was unbelievably it was his younger brother dude after this he was finally arrested and during an interrogation he admitted to killing cutshaw and allen some 13 years earlier sean gallon and his legal team has repeatedly blamed gallon's mental health issues on a bad drug trip that he took in 2001 which is bizarre he apparently took a large dose of lsd and then he was just never the same afterwards, apparently. In 2019, Gallon was sentenced to three life terms without the possibility of parole. My heart goes out to Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen, and of course, all of their friends and their families. Their murder pretty much came out of nowhere from a man, by the way, who they had never met and never even interacted with. But that was not the case for this next chilling story. In this story, the killer actually befriended his victims before doing the unthinkable. On November 14th, 2015, a blended family of seven began a camping trip on private property that they had recently purchased. They would have had no way of knowing this, but a drunken madman was emotionally attached to that very same piece of land and this strange attachment was about to boil over. A man named Thomas Camp had purchased this piece of property in Anderson County, Texas in August of 2015. Now, my understanding is that there was no permanent structures on the property, at least not yet, but Camp had been using the remote spot for camping trips. For this particular trip, he had invited a host of people to join him, including his two sons and his girlfriend, as well as his girlfriend's grandparents and his girlfriend's son. At some point earlier in the day on November 14th, a truck belonging to somebody in this group, I'm not exactly sure, had become stuck in the mud on the property. And it's at this point that they were approached by a 33 year old man on a tractor named William Hudson. Things didn't go sour immediately with Hudson. Apparently, he actually befriended the group and he even helped them pull the stuck truck out of the mud. And eventually he actually went back to the campsite with the family and shared a few drinks with them. And yet despite these friendly interactions, Hudson did apparently share his disappointment that the property's former owner had sold it to Camp. And it's also been reported that Camp was aware of Hudson's, I don't know, fondness of the property and even went as far as apparently putting up a gate to try to keep him out. This gate was apparently broken and, I don't know, cut through 
on the day that we're talking about here. Apparently, William Hudson was under the illusion that since he had spent so much time on the land years previously, that he was somehow entitled to it. He was enraged that the land had been sold and that he was now being denied access, despite the fact that the new owner was still being quite nice to him, let's be honest. And thus, later on that night, William Hudson snapped. He went on a killing spree, and by the end of the night, six of the seven campers were dead. The lone survivor, Cindy Johnson, actually hid from the gunman and was the first person to alert the authorities about the massacre. She later revealed that some of her husband's last words were actually when he called out to his killer saying, quote, why? Why are you doing this? I thought we were friends. Sheriff Greg Taylor described the scene as, quote, straight out of a horror movie. It's like something you'd watch on Halloween night. The authorities wasted no time at all, and it didn't take very long for them to zero in on William Hudson, and he was arrested the very next day. He was reportedly still wearing the very same blood-soaked clothing that he had worn while he committed the crimes. A background check on Hudson revealed that he was an extremely troubled individual. And just like the first story I told you, there was plenty of warning signs that something bad was bound to happen. Hudson's ex-wife was so afraid that he was going to kill her that she had actually gone out and gotten a restraining order against him. He had also threatened to kill his ex-wife's dog and he had multiple arrests for various offenses on his rap sheet. Ultimately, William Hudson was found guilty for his brutal crimes and, I mean, I won't get into it, but he was given the death sentence. The jury deliberated for less than 30 minutes before giving their verdict. And my understanding is that Hudson is still alive and he still sits on death row to this day. The victims of this deranged and senseless rampage were 23-year-old Nathan Camp, 21-year-old Austin Camp, 45-year-old Thomas Camp, 40-year-old Hannah Johnson, 76-year-old Carl Johnson, and 6-year-old, 6-year-old Cade Johnson. Uh, man, may they all rest in peace and my heart goes out to any of their surviving family members. I mean, it's just insane. This guy basically wiped out an entire family. And unfortunately, this wasn't the only time that a family was targeted by a killer while they were camping. From 2016 to 2018, a state park in Southern California was terrorized by a deranged survivalist with absolutely zero regard for human life. And the scariest part about this, at least in my opinion, is that it wasn't until a camper was killed in cold blood that the authorities finally connected the dots and arrested the man who would later go on to be known as the Malibu Sniper. Malibu Creek State Park is located less than 30 miles from downtown Los Angeles, making it a convenient location for city residents to get away from the traffic and the concrete and into some fresh air and some nature. The park is also a popular filming location for movies and TV shows since it's so close to Hollywood. In 2016, a wildlife biologist was sleeping in a hammock at the park when randomly, seemingly out of nowhere, he was struck in the arm with a bullet. And then only five days later, an anonymous person who was sleeping in a car nearby the park was also shot at. Fortunately, both these individuals survived, but it served as a chilling reminder that the violence that is usually contained to the city limits could easily spread, you know, over into the surrounding areas. Three more cars were shot at in the area in 2017, and a string of burglaries were also committed. And then in mid-June of the following year, that's 2018, a Tesla driving just outside of the park was also hit by gunfire. There was a clear pattern of crime and violence in this area, and yet despite this, my loose understanding anyways is that the authorities believed that all these events were actually unrelated. That belief 
would quickly come crashing down, however, because on June 18th, 2018, 35-year-old Tristan Baudet was shot dead while laying in his tent with his two and four-year-old daughters at Malibu Creek State Park. Fortunately, the two girls were not hit, but this senseless crime sent those that frequented the park, as well as the residents in the surrounding area, into a frenzy. And for a few months, the authorities had no idea who committed this murder. But then a few months later, this time in October, authorities spotted a suspicious man kind of hiding in a ravine at the state park. They made contact and they actually discovered that this man was dressed in all black and perhaps most chillingly, was carrying a rifle in his backpack. This obviously set off all sorts of alarm bells, which was a trend that continued once the man's identity and criminal history was learned. His name was Anthony Rauda, and he was arrested on the spot, not for the murder initially, but rather for suspicion of burglary. This was not the first time that Rauda had been arrested. He had a long rap sheet, including a 2006 conviction for possessing explosives, as well as a 2014 conviction for being a felon with a loaded gun. That's just the tip of the iceberg, by the way. At the time of this latest arrest, he was actually out on probation. Ballistics tests were done on the rifle that he was found carrying, and this proved that it was the very same weapon used in Tristan Baudet's murder, as well as the string of shootings that had occurred in the area over the previous two years. Anthony Rada had been sort of a survivalist, you could say. He was living in the outdoors around the area near the state park, and he was getting by by stealing food and other supplies. He was initially charged with one count of second degree murder, 10 counts of attempted murder, and five counts of burglary. And ultimately, he was sentenced to 119 years in prison, essentially a life sentence which has allowed Malibu State Park to return to the peaceful area that it was always supposed to be. May Tristan Baudet rest in peace, and my heart goes out to his family, especially his daughters, and man, I just hope that they're doing, they're doing well now. It's always awful to hear that children are involved in a crime like this, and fortunately in this story, the two daughters were unharmed, at least physically, but I gotta warn you in this next story, they're definitely was a child that was harmed. And man, this next one is, it's a tough one, folks. A good friend of mine and also an editor and producer for this channel, Luke McKay, was in the middle of his 2021 Appalachian Trail through hike when he was woken up in the middle of the night by police officers. He was camped on the trail near Boonesboro, Maryland, and the officers asked him if he had seen a man and a little boy in the area. He told them that he hadn't, and then he tried his best to go back to sleep. When he woke up in the morning, he quickly discovered that the area was crawling with police officers and officials, and there was one particular lookout that was guarded and 100% off limits. Clearly, something bad had happened there. As it would turn out, Luke was camped only a very short distance away from an extremely grisly scene. At 10.30 p.m. on June 10th, 2021, a worried mother reported that both her husband and her two-year-old son had gone missing. She stated that her son had been staying at her parents' house and that her husband had picked him up earlier to take him on a little hike. She had located her husband's car at an Appalachian Trail parking lot in Boonesboro. When she reported the two missing, she was very concerned because her husband had been, quote, despondent lately. Tragically, this entire situation would end with the death of both her husband and her child, who apparently died at the hands of her husband. The husband's name was Sean Thompson and the child's name was Dawson Thompson. Both bodies were located early in the morning on June 11th and they also both had quote obvious trauma and a knife was recovered from the scene as well. There haven't been many updates to this story since the news officially broke back in 2021 so I do want to say that I don't think there was ever any official proof that the father killed his child, 
but it has been assumed in all the media reports that that is what happened. And there really isn't any other information about this story, to be honest. It's really just a tragic case with no happy ending whatsoever. Our next story is also extremely tragic, but at least in this story, there is somewhat of a happy ending with a deserving individual brought to justice years and years after he committed an extremely heinous crime. On July 9th, 1976, a young couple went to a quiet park to camp for the night. The spot that they chose was called McClintock Park, and it's roughly an hour and a half north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. At some point after getting their tent set up, David Schuldes and his fiance, Ellen Matthews, were attacked and killed. Matthews was also, I can't say it because of YouTube, but essayed, we'll say, as well. The crime scene was absolutely horrific, but the killer's DNA was recovered from Matthew's body. Unfortunately, though, this was of little use back in 1976, and the case quickly went cold and probably would have remained that way forever if law enforcement had forgotten about it. Thankfully, they didn't, though, and as DNA technology improved over the decades, it began to seem more and more likely that eventually the campsite killer was going to be caught and brought to justice. Everything in this case changed in 2019, some 43 years after the crimes had been committed. Using technology known as genetic genealogy, scientists were able to create a suspect pool, a very specific one by the way, that consisted of an exact family that lived in the Green Bay, Wisconsin area. Their data was pointing the finger at one of eight related individuals. They had that narrowed down, and so now investigators needed DNA samples from each of these people in order to try and match them with the DNA found at the crime scene. The authorities needed to get creative in order to obtain each suspect's DNA. And so they actually went dumpster diving for the first individual, and they were able to obtain an inhaler that he had thrown away by just digging through his trash. This inhaler had some DNA on it, but this DNA did not match the killers, and so they moved on to the second suspect. The second suspect's DNA was obtained when investigators got their hands on a coffee cup that he had recently used, but his DNA didn't match the killers either, and so they moved on again, and they really hoped that the third time would be the charm. Investigators got especially creative with their third suspect. The man's name was Raymond Van Evenhoven, and in March of 2019, he found himself with two police officers on his front porch. They asked him to complete a quote, brief survey about policing in the various townships, and they then instructed him to seal the survey shut in an envelope. In order to do this, Van Evenhoven licked the envelope before handing it back over to the officers, which essentially meant that he just handed over his DNA. They had tricked him successfully and his DNA matched the DNA recovered from the crime scene nearly 43 years earlier, proving that Raymond Van Evenhoven was in fact the killer. At this point, he was 82 years old. Van Evenhoven maintained his innocence, but he was in fact convicted for the crimes and sentenced to two consecutive life terms. Less than 10 months into his sentence, Van Evenhoven died, and he died without ever confessing to the killings. So normally with these hiking stories, I've been making donations to and calling out search and rescue organizations, but this video is a little bit different. This time, in order to give back, I've made a donation to the National Center for Victims of Crime, whose mission is to quote, forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. Now, I'm not affiliated with this organization in any way, but I will have a link to their website in the description if you want to join me in my journey to give back. May David Schuldes and Ellen Matthews rest in peace, and I just want to thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next week.